Um, um, I'll jump right, right into, into kind of an right. overview of the way, way I'm going to move through this uh, segment. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about kind of planning, just real high level overview. We'll get into the catalog, um, the Johnny's catalog about how we order seeds, what we're looking for whenever I'm looking at, you know, what's coming in from each year. You know, it's not just the same varieties year after year. There, there's breeders that are constantly working on improving what's out there. So I just want to stay up to date on, on what's coming out. Uh, and then we'll move into actually some of the cool like tools and techniques, probably what a lot of people are tuning in for, um, of how we actually go from seed to field. And so we got some cool video to, to show you and all, all sorts of things ahead. Um, so I'll just jump right into the planning and just kind of how I do it. And that'll give you some kind of context for how I navigate looking through the catalog and picking out what I'm gonna grow for the year. Um, so yeah, so when uh, planning, you know, before you're ordering this stuff, uh, you know, you can plan your garden from shooting from the hip and just throw a bunch of stuff out there. I find it's really valuable for us since we're trying to maximize production to get a game plan well before the season starts. Um, so I start off with a, a farm map. I know you can't see that word really well. It's just for the point of talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know exactly how many beds I have, how many acres I have, what I can plant, what's going to be in cover crop, and then I can figure out where I want to physically put stuff around the farm. Um, whether you have a home garden, a uh, homestead or a farm, that's a good first step. And then this may look really intimidating, but this is my Excel spreadsheet um, for how I actually go about planting, uh, planning out how many crops I need, how many pounds of food I need for which markets, uh, how many seeds I need to order. It doesn't have to be that crazy. Um, this is a, a chart from the University of Arkansas, and they're probably in any state that y'all are watching from that just says what month it is and what you need to be starting. So it can be as simple as that. So, so to jump over to the catalog, now that I know about how much of, of what I want and where I want to put it, um, the first thing I do is I open up to you know page four, I think it is. Uh, Kennedy's going to be putting that up on the screen. It's a, a chart that just shows you know things that are direct seeded, typically things that are transplanted, typically, and what um, the ideal spacing, what the ideal yield is for those things. And so when I get the catalog, I know I have records of what I sold last year, what I was able to move last year and I can highlight each thing and and see okay I don't need to grow Belgian endive <laughs> no one wants that <laughs> rutabagas weren't a hit uh, fennel not a hit and so I can just highlight what works for our area um, and then know about how many pounds I'd get per bed um, or per row and then translate that and how many acres I need and how many times I need to plant that um, the next thing we're going to take a look at um, is, is how many seeds. So Johnny's does a great job of showing how many uh, seeds you need to get a certain yield or how many uh, seeds are per pound. If you order by a pound of, of seeds, they're all different sizes. So uh, Johnny's has done a great job of actually allowing you to buy in, in numbers and not buy ounces uh, on most, most things. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is what's called developing a program. Uh, so if you're looking through the Johnny's catalog, you'll see like broccoli or carrots or lettuce, um, lettuce in particular. Uh, Johnny's has outlined a program for that. And so just like in a TV uh, station has a programming, you know, what show follows what show follows what show. Uh, you know, we try and develop that as, as production growers uh, to keep a particular crop going throughout the year. You know, certain varieties of lettuce will like the heat, certain varieties will not thrive at all. And so we're actually changing varieties throughout the year. Uh, to just plant the same thing year round doesn't typically work. Um, there are some exceptions of that, um, but following a program is a great way to do that, even for home gardeners. You know, you may only start six uh, broccoli plants, but if you did, you could change varieties each time for a spring variety or one that performs better in the fall. The next thing that I'm looking at when I'm looking through that catalog is what varieties in particular. I know what I want to grow, I know how many seeds I need, what varieties are really going to do best for the production system I have. And so a lot of that depends on, are you growing in a tunnel? Are you, uh, what zone are you in? Are you in Florida, are you in Maine? Um, what diseases are in your area? What diseases have you struggled with in the past? Uh, pests, if you wanna trellis or just let it go crazy on the ground. Um, all those things are really important uh, features to look at for a variety. Uh, so because you know we're, we're growing for market, we're really heavily considering production and yield. Uh, flavor is a component of that. Uh, we're certified organic, so getting organic seeds is a component of that. Um, but we're not just growing the prettiest thing, and we're also not growing a huge uh, 
lots of varieties of tomatoes. We generally grow about three varieties of tomatoes a year, um, and that's what we find the market uh, moves the most. You can do too much and oversaturate, uh, you know, have too many choices. So um, some of the symbols that I'm looking for are the OG, the organic symbol. Uh, we prioritize organic seeds. Uh, we have to in order to be certified. Um, I'm looking for heat resistance. So the tomato variety that's, that's being shown now, Grain Marshall, is a, a new favorite of mine that grew all throughout the summer, sweltering heat in August, um, and produced just loads and loads of tomatoes. Um, we were tomatoed out by the end of the season for sure. Um, and so it has that little heat symbol, uh, that little scorching sun. It's the only tomato variety in the Johnny's catalog that has that symbol. So for me, that was an instant indicator. I need that for my August planting. Um, all our other tomatoes, our heirlooms, are grown in tunnel. So I'm looking for variety, varieties that have the little greenhouse symbol, and that means that they are resistant to uh, high humidity diseases. They uh, perform really well to, um, to intensive uh, trellising and pruning. Uh, trellising is another element of that, that you can see the little, little trellis uh, symbol. Uh, that way you know, you know what kind of um, uh, support do I need to provide to this plant. So those are some really important features to be thinking about. So we've got our plan, right? We got the farm plan. We know what we want to grow. We know how much. We've got our catalog. We've ordered our seeds. Um, now the next st step is starting them. They've all come in the mail. It's time to get started. So things we need are something to put uh, the seed in. So we need soil. Um, we need something to put that soil in, either a block or a, a container of some sort. Uh, and then something to put that in to get it to germinate something to put it in to uh, help it grow like a greenhouse um, before it's ready to go into the ground. So I'm going to go through all those things and talk about some of the tools and techniques we're using to help you hopefully have a really successful spring, whether you're a gardener or professional grower. Um, so the soil, let's uh, spin around over here real quick. Uh, we've made our own soil for a while. We're actually buying it in certified organic from a, um, uh, a supplier uh, in Northwest Arkansas called Nitron Industries. They make a great mix that we've, we've gone to. Um, it works good for either containers or using it for the, the soil blocks. Um, this is a horse feed bunk. I think it's really important to, to not get fatigued while you're working. So having something that's waist height has been really helpful to us. This is like 150 bucks. Uh, holds a good amount of soil so we can uh, get a lot done. Uh, so we have our soil. Um, we also have, I should say, we also uh, some of the previous live streams we've done, the seed starting live streams that are on our Facebook page, uh, I have a recipe in there for our old uh, recipe for soil. I'm sure we could, we could link that or, or put that in there too. Um, so you got your soil. Uh, you know, there's organic options, even from like miracle Grow uh, has an organic option that you can get at Lowe's. Uh, if that's a value that, that you're trying to, to implement in your garden space. The next step is what do you put that soil in? So we don't have a, lot, a huge greenhouse space for the size farm we are. And also we, have, we do some nursery work too. So we, we really get pretty crunched. So I typically use pretty small tray sizes. Um, I just plant my plants a little bit earlier. Um, or uh, we use soil blocks for things like tomatoes and peppers, cucumbers, the big stuff, anything like lettuces, brassicas, uh, onions, they all go in smaller trays. So I'm gonna show you what some of those trays are here. Um, Johnny's has a number of trays uh, that I've used. I think these came from Greenhouse Megastore uh, just because they're, they're so small was something I was looking for. This, this holds 500 plants, so this could almost hold all the tomatoes for an entire high tunnel. Um, 500, uh, I think this is 288, and 231, this is our, our standard tray that we're using for a lot of our stuff, including our brassicas and all of our lettuces that are over here. Let's show some full examples. Yeah. And tell, and tell folks what you got planted in these over here. Yeah, so these are these are our uh, Tierra cabbages, and so we'll do a number of plantings of, of this. It's a it's a really great uh, baby cabbage um, that gets to a nice like two three pound size really quickly, and we can plant it pretty much throughout the year. Uh, so these are two thirty ones. They won't stay in here, but for like another two weeks, and then they'll come out and go into the ground. So I don't like to plant really large cabbage plants. Um, they just tend not to do as well. Um, it's, a, it's a big shock to them, the bigger that they are. Uh, the lettuces too, this is a, a good example of that. You know, we're, we're really trying to aim for consistent germination. Um, 
consistent sized plants, healthy plants. These are all in those 231s. Okay, get a nice close up on them. So what, what, what varieties you got here? So this is Segalane. It's a, um, I think it's a small bib, uh, dwarf bib. Uh, this is Salanova, uh, a standard for a lot of uh, production growers. You can cut it, it comes back, you can cut it again, especially in the winter time. Um, cool. here, here's some full size examples. You can leave it there. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah, they just boop. Nice little plants. Nice. So that's one option is to use the trays. And you know, they make pretty large size trays where there's 18 plants for a full 10 by 20 tray. Uh, for our tomatoes, our larger plants, I like to use the soil blocks. So it, it's like a tiny little brick. Uh, and what's nice about it is like as the plant grows, we're in a normal container, those roots would hit the bottom of that container and spin around in circles. With the soil block, it hits the edge and it prunes itself and then sends that root a different direction. So it's great because it uses the full volume of the space versus like in a, a rather regular flat, those roots may just circle around the bottom and not really do anything useful. And two, it accepts like transplanting really well because it has all these roots right around the outside of the container uh, that are just ready and hungry for new soil to get into. So it handles transplanting really well. Especially if we, you know, obviously polar vortex last week, uh, <laughs> you know, we need to be uh, flexible to what the weather conditions are doing. So I like to keep my larger plants, the peppers, cucumbers, eggplants, tomatoes in the tunnel protected. Yeah, these got, these got uh, winter, uh, a cold spot in the greenhouse, got those guys. Um, the, um, you know, we want to keep them in here and protect it as long as we can until they're ready to go out into the high tunnel. And so using the bigger soil blocks really helps. Uh, so we just use our standard, standard mix and then you just compress it within this little device. So it makes a small little block. Mm -hmm. You could plant your tomato seed and then the next size up, this is the, the four row, um, makes an indention for this, or you can just do a standard, you could plant directly into this size. And then a larger size has an indention for this size. So you just stair step up the plant. Um, and really, I, I find that's a really useful uh, technique. It's called potting on, uh, regardless of if you're using trays or the soil blocks, because you're just gonna have a healthier plant. Um, if you use a big pot and, you're just, and you put a little plant in it and you're watering it constantly, you're flushing out all that nutrition. So letting that plant get into fresh soil with uh, nutrients uh, and kind of size its way up is just really helpful to that plant. So this was, this is the, the four row. The five row is the same thing. I think it's just a little bit longer. Um, these are great for uh, lettuces. You can use these soil blocks for lettuces or cut flowers, uh, really anything since they all nest into each other. Uh, the largest size soil block, I, you know, I wouldn't use that for a broccoli plant. I would do something that's more high value so it's, since it takes a lot of soil. Um, so your heirloom tomatoes, cucumbers, really high yielding type of things. Um, so, you know, we have our containers, we have our soil blocks. Um, now we need to put seeds in them, right? Uh, so, so seeding is the next step that we'll talk about. Uh, a quick note, make sure you label your seeds. <laughs> we have been using plastic uh, seed marking um, trays and I decided I really don't like them because I keep finding them in the field. So we're going to wood. So if we leave it in the field, it just can live there. Um, and so one of the things we, we like to do is we dibble the soil. So we make an indention for the soil. You can totally use your fingers. That's totally fine. You can do this sort of thing really fast and make holes for your, for your plants. We actually had this one custom made for us through the innovation hub uh, in Little Rock. And so it's, it's partially 3D printed and acrylic and it fits this 231 perfectly, makes great holes in it. So we got our block filled with our soil over in our, our horse trough. We've made the holes for the seeds and then we're gonna drop seeds into it. You can do that by hand. Um, Johnny's also has a number of seeders that are like uh, individual seeders, vibrating seeders. Uh, we have used these. This actually fits. This is a, a vacuum seeder that I, I made probably for about 25 bucks for everything. And it actually fits our soil block seeder. And so the little needles are interchangeable. So we can change them for different seeds. There's different size trays, so they'll fit 
different size uh, spacings for different size trays. That's one way to seed. Um, for things that are round, they tend to roll really well. And so we actually had a company in the UK, Aquaponics Lab, uh, make this drop seeder for us. zoom in on the, the company there just in case. Cool. It's custom made, got the Cut. custom logo up Heifer there. Heifer International logo on it, isn't that cool? Mm-hmm. And so the trays are all interchangeable and it's a, it's a drop seeder where you you roll the seeds around. Once they get in the hole, you just push the lever and the holes line up, it drops all the seeds at once. So one person can seed tens of thousands of seeds without ever really breaking a sweat. Uh, Johnny's has a similar model that's all acrylic and this is for the, the paper pot transplanter. Mm -hmm. Similar thing, you roll the holes around, when you push it together, the seeds fall through. Nice. Okay, so that should have answered a couple of questions. I think we had nice. a few folks ask about, you know, how exactly we we use them. Some people are saying, you know, they're using tweezers and planting one at a time, and you yeah. ever have to do that? I, I do have to do that, too. You know, some of our uh, uh, cherry tomato seeds tend to be really, really tiny and oddly shaped, and when you touch them with the tweezer, they shoot off in some direction. So I'll use just like a spoon. Um, also a lot of cut flower seeds are so, so tiny. They're almost like dust. Um, so I like to use a spoon and then a, a, a toothpick or, some, or a you know, pencil or something. Uh, I can just push them out into each cell as I need it. So we got the seeds in the soil. Uh, and now what? How do we get those seeds to germinate really well? Uh, we're gonna cut over uh, to a video that's gonna show a little bit more about that process. So this is our germination station, or germination chamber. It is basically just a tent. Um, this is a mylar coating, so it reflects all the light from the, uh, the light, and it helps keep the humidity high. You can have this whole setup without these lights. That's totally fine. The main goal is just to have a closed space that's high humidity. In the bottom, we have a humidifier with a heating element, so that'll produce heat and humidity for the early spring when it's important to get warm temperatures in here for things like peppers and tomatoes. We also have an ultrasonic humidifier, which has no additional heat. It just uses vibration to kick up humidity into the air. And that's really important for the summer when you actually need cool temperatures to get things to germinate, even inside, even though it's air conditioned space. I do like having the lights as an option in here in the top couple rows, because some of the things uh, like our eggplants and tomatoes, and these are actually artichokes, are gonna benefit from having some additional light. And another advantage of having the lights in here are for things like some of our flowers, as well as some vegetables, very few vegetables, actually benefit from having light to help them germinate. And I think any kind of horticultural type website should have something like this uh, for indoor, like hydroponic type growing. I got shelves from Lowe's, LED lights from Lowe's. The LEDs are important because they don't put off a lot of heat. So even with, you know, four lights and I can turn on these two, it's still not gonna get really above like 75, maybe 85 if I had it all zipped up, um, which isn't, isn't too warm for things like tomatoes and peppers. I also keep a humidity and temperature monitor. So this will give me a high low of humidity, a high low of temperature. Uh, because I've had it open, the humidity's really dropped. But once I put all these trays that I'm about to seed in here and they're all moist, it's gonna get pretty humid in there, even without turning on the humidifiers. So I like to keep track of that. I use bottom watering trays because we're inside a building. So it's just a, a closed tray that our seed tray sits inside of that. And then we just fill it with water. So I just try and check on these about every day, every other day. I will fill it up on Friday and I don't have to think about this whole setup until Monday. Because there's so many different people watching, home gardeners, people that may be interested in gardening and farmers, um, what you saw in the video of the germination chamber, if you are a small home gardener, that, that could suffice. You wouldn't even need a greenhouse. You could just get your plants to full size, ready to transplant in something like that, where it's just grow lights. You don't even need the tent, honestly. Um, so we're just using kind of a dual purpose germination chamber and um, a grow chamber, I guess, for things like our tomatoes. Uh, it's also, if we graft our tomatoes, we can let them heal in there. So it does a lot of purposes. Um, you know, you could stop right there. Uh, if you are, have a window balcony gardening, you know, you could start seeds on a window seal. Um, but once you get to a certain uh, size where, you're, uh, where it doesn't make sense to either buy transplants from another farmer, you know, and you can always check too, if you're just getting into this, 
um, plant sales that are in your area. Talk to area farmers. See, they may have extra plants. Um, so you can, you know, you don't necessarily have to start all your own seeds. Some people enjoy doing that, but it can also be um, detract from what you're trying to do. Um, if you're finding value in the content, hit that like and subscribe button. Follow us on YouTube. It'll help us out a lot and it'll help us reach more farmers so we can share this information. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, in the, the structure itself, you know, it's, it's basically just covered in plastic and not any plastic will do. It really has to, you know, for the person who asked about the, the cattle panel greenhouse, you can't just go to Lowe's and get this plastic. It's, it has to be UV treated. And so this is a special plastic. It lasts about four, maybe five years if you push it. Um, but if you just use standard like drop cloth plastic from Lowe's, it'll turn to, it'll just disintegrate. Um, so it really has to be special plastic uh, and you can usually order it online. Um, and then, you know, it'll get crazy hot in here if you don't have proper ventilation. Uh, yesterday we were pouring sweat <laughs> during the, the dry run uh, once we turned off the fan. So the fan is hooked up to a thermostat. Uh, there's also, you know, if you want to manually raise up sides or open doors, you can do that sort of thing as well. Um, but you know, we have a, this is a, a residential heater, propane heater, and that really wasn't enough heat uh, to heat this 24 by um, 40 foot uh, greenhouse. Mm -hmm. you so know, th this, sp this space right here wasn't even enough for this? Yeah, this is not enough uh, you said heat. this is 24 by? This is 24 by 40, okay. I think. Um, so uh, I ordered one and it was like, it was stopped by the trucks, like in all the snow. <laughs> <laughs> so we did, we, the snow stopped our heater from getting here, unfortunately, uh, but it was fine. Um, so yeah, something like that, even just like a radiating electric heater will work uh, just fine to, to get you the heat you need. You can also buy mats that the plants actually sit on and that'll help uh, heat them. In the summer months, we actually put shade cloth up here. Like it's a 30% shade cloth, it's UV treated, it blocks out 30% of all the sunlight and it's still just scorching in here. So that's with fans going. Um, we use a, a misting system to water our plants that also helps have some evaporative cooling. I'm gonna show those things, okay? I hope you can see them. All right, we got a misting system up here at the top and it runs all the way down. Mm -hmm. We got random fans hanging on the ceiling. <laughs> just to get air movement. Just I mean, to get air movement. Yeah, we'll have fans down here on the tables in the summer. And Rhonda Willett asked about the temperature in the greenhouse. We're gonna answer your question, Rhonda, one sec. And then there's the big daddy fan over there. It's closed, but we, we, we'll turn that on just to circulate air a lot of times. Oh wait, there's another little heater over there. Another little heater over there. I imagine you brought a lot of those in here during just, yeah. Snowmageddon when, last when, week. When it was negative three last week. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so Rhonda Willett asked about what temperature you keep this space. Yeah, so, so obviously in the summertime, you know, if, even with the vent, I'm just bringing in hot air through the tunnel. So it, you know, it might not get below 90 in the tunnel. Um, so we also limit the amount of time we work in here. So really this is a space for starting plants and not for seeding. So we don't do a lot of seeding unless it's the winter time when it might actually be enjoyable to be in here. Um, I don't want it to get below 50 because uh, it can cold shock these, these tomatoes. Obviously that was what happened. I don't think they froze. I think they just got cold shocked. Mm -hmm. um, they were kind of in a corner where there wasn't a lot of air movement. Um, so there can be big temperature gradients. So having a fan is really important in a, in a greenhouse. Um, and so yeah, so somewhere between 50 and 90, ideally if it was 75 year round, that would be incredible. But that's- You keep talking, I'm gonna show them the, the thermostat and humidifier and you can tell them about that. Yeah, um, so we kind of keep track of our, uh, I, I use a lot of, of monitoring type things. These are just little magnetic um, humidifier uh, or humidity and temperature gauges just to get a, a, a mind, uh, just to be able to know kind of what's going on in the greenhouse. Uh, thermostat, you can adjust the temperature if you want it warmer. Uh, for things like, like peppers, it'll wait longer before it kicks on that fan. Um, in the summertime, it basically just runs because uh, it'll just always be so hot. And, and quick disclaimer, if those temperatures weren't what he said that we usually keep it at, it's because we have the fans off and the doors open for this live stream. So a yeah. little, little different in here than normal. Yep. Um, let's see, okay, I'm gonna answer as many more questions really quick, or he's going to, yeah. I'm gonna ask him. And then we're gonna give away the six row cedar uh, at the end of the broadcast. So let's see, um, how often are you watering in here? So it, that And also, that question comes from Susan Schwartz. Uh, so Susan, it, it changes throughout the year. So um, we, we don't live on site. I, I live 45 minutes away, so I'm not at the farm every day. Uh, no one really works the weekends. Um, and so we did switch to an automated system 
Um, it's not ideal because some things it might be overwatering, some things underwatering uh, with this misting system. So what I do is I change how long it waters uh, throughout like almost uh, every other week. I'm either adding minutes or taking minutes away or watering twice a day. Like in the summertime, I may actually need to water twice a day. Um, so right now in the winter, it's only watering for like 20 minutes once a day. And that's, that's all I need. That's, that's more than what I need probably. <laughs> Um, and then we, you can spot water by hand as well. How do you manage pests in the greenhouse? Do you, yeah. Is pest pressure a problem as much in this space? Yeah, yeah, it definitely can be. And so there's options in a greenhouse for covering the entrances and like even the fans uh, with insect netting. So you've literally physically blocked all the insects from coming in and out of the greenhouse. Um, that's, a, that's a good option. Um, for one, like our, my worst pest that I lost the most things to was the mice. And so just going to the metal tables really helped deal with that. Um, we, we have had uh, army worms and different caterpillars that have been a problem. And so a spray of, of Dipel, which is an organic approved BT, um, will usually deal with that pretty quickly. And then anything else is, is really just if healthy plants tend to be able to defend themselves uh, properly against uh, pest and disease. So having really healthy transplants, which starts with good soil, good air circulation, and good watering. Um, if you're overwatering, you're gonna have dampening off issues and disease issues and, uh, and gnats and stuff like that. Um, so you can just dial back on the watering and it'll pretty much maybe even resolve itself. So if you haven't already, click the link in the description of this video, go to our link tree page and subscribe to our newsletter and then you'll know about everything that we do here at Heifer Ranch. We also have a really cool program um, that I want to tell you about right now and this might be perfect for you if you're watching this or someone you know. It's a very unique opportunity for folks who are interested in uh, sustainable market gardening. Everything that you're seeing here. We also have regenerative livestock management programs here at the ranch too. We do grass-fed beef, uh, we do pastured poultry. You'll see all this stuff on our YouTube page. But the reason I'm telling you about all this is because we have an awesome residential volunteer program. Okay, you can come here, join our community. We have dozens of volunteers. You come live on site. We've got housing. You get a daily stipend. You get food. And you get to learn and play with us in the garden and in the pastures and with the animals. And it's a really awesome experience for anybody who wants to learn um, and get first hands-on experience doing this kind of stuff mm -hmm. and join a really awesome community of people uh, who are having a lot of fun together doing it and educating other people on how to do it. So that information is on our website, uh, heiferusa, or heifer.org slash USA. Uh, it's also on our link tree. Just go to the link tree. The link tree has everything. Okay, okay, here's a great question, all right? And this is something we didn't cover that is really after this part of the process. So. We start our seeds, we germinate them, we treat them lovingly inside here, and then before we transplant them, before we uh, put them in the greenhouses out in the actual garden, we do a technique called hardening them off. And we got a great question about hardening them off uh, from, oh, where'd you go? I wanna recognize you. Henry Atkinson, thanks Henry for the question. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Sean to talk about how, what we do before these puppies go into our garden. Yeah, so I'm not a good one to ask about that because I don't really do that. <laughs> <laughs> you do? But, I see them out there all the time. A little bit, a little bit. It depends on the season. So if they're going from temperatures that are similar to what's in the greenhouse out in the field, they can usually just go out in the field. Uh, also, like I said about the, the brassicas, like I use smaller transplants and I feel like they handle it a little bit better um, than if you have this big honking plant in this little four inch pot and you try and transplant that, it's going to get shocked. Um, and then the, the tomatoes, because they're just going out into the high tunnel, they also tend to handle that pretty well, and because I'm using the soil block. Um, so hardening off is a technique where you kind of basically prepare the plant for out of the loving conditions of a greenhouse and into the harsher conditions of the field. So it's usually like three to five days, um, some people do a week, of like sitting outside the tunnel. Obviously, if you get a frost, bring your tomatoes in. They can't handle that, but it just kind of helps them toughen up their stem with the wind, um, deal with rain, a little bit less watering, and get ready for, for life, life on the farm. Absolutely, life on the farm. That's what it's all about, folks. <laughs> uh, farming, learning how to farm, training and educate farmers, that's what we're all about here at Heifer USA. So on behalf of all of our team that are responsible for this, you know, Ian Peters, Kennedy Reynolds, behind the scenes, helping switch the scenes and answer your comments, Tyler Pearson, Sean Passara, 
uh, from our team here at Heifer Ranch. Thank you all so much for joining us.